We are going to energize the country. We need to wake up and smell the coffee. The independence case is a powerful one. Another future is possible, but we've got to fight for it. Order! Hello and welcome to the Debated Podcast. As always, I'm your host, Will. And in this episode, I'm delighted to be joined by Stephen Kimmick, the Labour MP for Abba Avon, Shadow Minister for Asia and the Pacific, and Chair of the Labour Renaissance Group. Welcome to the podcast, Stephen. Thank you very much, Will. Thanks for inviting me. Well, it's a delight to have you on. Um, the first question that I'd like to ask is, uh, as I mentioned there, you're Chair of the Labour Renaissance Group. Now, we have done a podcast uh, with Joe from the Labour Renaissance Group before, but in case people haven't heard that podcast or haven't heard of the Labour Renaissance Group, could you give a, a, a quick explanation as to what the group is and why you decided to become involved with it? Yes, yeah, so in a nutshell, it's about the uh, purpose of the Labour Party on the one hand, and on the other hand, it's about what we need to do to win the next election. So there's a, an element of it which is very much about what is in our hearts as Labour Party members and activists and supporters in terms of what we want the Labour Party to be and um, how it can change the country for the better. It's what is authentically in our DNA. And then there's a hard-headed uh, piece of electoral uh, calculus in all of this, which is that we need to win 124 seats in order to be able to form a government without the support of any other party. So we're facing an electoral Everest. Uh, and the 60% uh, of those seats are in uh, small towns with populations that are not very ethnically diverse, uh, with the, and they're often a bit older, and where there's a relatively high number of people who don't have a university degree. Mm. So there are, there are some commonalities there in terms of how what we need to do to win. Now, the good news is that who we are as a party and who we, we represent, the, mm. the working people of this country, uh, that is what the Labour Party is about, but they are also the people that we need to win back. They're the people mm. that are deserting us for uh, many years now um, and where it all really came to a head in December 2019. Uh, but December 2019 was uh, the, the final uh, blow in a series of blows that we've been receiving for a, for a very long time um, as those communities have been deserting us. So Renaissance is about putting those two things together, saying this is the authentic identity of the Labour Party. This is who we are and who we stand for, who we were founded to represent. Mm. And it's also about how we keep focused on winning back those seats. Mm. And then we ran up our first project, which I'm sure we can go on to talk a bit more about, but that was about talking to those voters mm -hmm. and finding that common ground between what they were looking for in, in a Labour Party that might bring them back to Labour because they're, they're people who, who've been deserting the party um, uh, over the last five to ten years. Mm, yes, absolutely. And, and um, that's what our first project was about. And, and we've done yes. a report on that and we're now taking it out to constituency Labour parties all over the country. Mm -hmm, absolutely. And, and one of the things that is quite clear from looking at uh, the website and from hearing you speak is the emphasis on uh, communities and the need to um, perhaps reignite feeling in particular communities related to the Labour Party. Now, one of the ways that um, the website suggests and the report suggests that you can uh, reignite a connection is through jobs, is through um, well-paid uh, work that isn't um, relying perhaps on materials that are um, too much from overseas. I know that you gave a, a speech on, on the need for um, more British steel and the um, to improve the amount of British steel uh, that we use in construction projects. How do you think that we can encourage, um, you know, more jobs and, and, and better paid jobs from a position of opposition? Because in a way it is quite difficult, isn't it, to, to, to be able to um, encourage something like that from a, a position of uh, not being in government? Well, a, a big part of this is, is about getting elected. You're absolutely mm -hmm. right, Will, that there's very little that you can do when you're sitting on the opposition benches and you don't have a majority in Parliament. You can't get the legislation through that you would like to get through and you spend most of your time holding the government to account mm -hmm. and, generally speaking, are opposing what they're 
proposing because it's it's wrong headed and it's not actually going to be in the long term interests of the country. Um, but that's that's the role of opposition. Yeah. We need to be in government. We need to win general elections. And a big part of what we need to do in order to win is to make it absolutely clear to people that what drives the Labour Party, what gets us out of bed in the morning, is that we are the party that wants to create good jobs that you can raise a family. Mm -hmm. And the way in which we create those jobs is, is many and varied. Um, mm -hmm. But that w w what we are saying is that the British economy has become dangerously skewed mm -hmm. away from manufacturing and into services. And that's driven uh, an exodus of investment and resources and talent from our manufacturing heartlands to London and the Southeast. So it's been a double whammy, really. The collapse of our manufacturing sector uh, uh, has not only made our economy less resilient and made us far too dependent on um, imports and on consumption as opposed to exports and production, it has also driven uh, the massive inequality that we see now between London and the Southeast and the rest of the country. So a modern manufacturing renaissance has to be at the heart of what we stand for. And that is what we could, what can deliver good jobs you can raise a family on. And I think what Labour needs to do mm -hmm. is talk much more about the dignity of good work as well. Mm -hmm. Of course, it's about the, the paycheck that you have at the end of the month, but it's also about being part of something bigger. It's about that sense of self-esteem. It's about uh, what you can contribute to your community, the pride mm -hmm. that you feel when you're putting food on the table for your family. Um, so I think the, the dignity of labor mm -hmm. uh, is a really big part. And, and what we talked about in these um, conversations that we had with former labor voters was about the emotional power of work mm -hmm. and good jobs and jobs you can raise a family on. So uh, the, the heart that uh, um, we can talk in much more detail about mm. the policies that are required to drive that modern manufacturing renaissance. You know, we need a complete reform of our banking sector. Mm -hmm. We need far more investment in research and development. We need the creation of clusters around universities. So that you've got, um, we're not talking here about going back to the old factories and smokestacks. Mm. Yeah. We're talking much more about smaller, family-run businesses perhaps mm -hmm. that are that are, are, are manufacturing those niche products uh, and often you know we hope actually starting to sell them to china you know mm -hmm. the, the, yeah. the balance of trade with china is completely skewed in one direction so mm -hmm. um yeah that that's what that's what the the jobs piece is about but uh, it's it's also about not just talking about jobs as if it's something to do with numbers on a spreadsheet mm -hmm. it's actually also about the huge significance of jobs in terms of what it means to people's identity mm. and as the party of work and good jobs um, we think we've got a huge political opportunity to make mm. that argument uh, in a way that can start to reconnect us with the, the voters that we've been losing. Yes absolutely and, and one of the other things that you you focus on both in your response there and you can see on the uh, Labour Renaissance website is the emphasis on families on being able to support families, whether it be through supporting them, uh, helping to raise children and in ensuring that children have the best possible education uh, that they can, uh, as well as the other end of the spectrum, helping um, the elderly in uh, nursing homes where quite often there aren't uh, enough carers and there isn't enough support uh, for the care sector. Do you think that people might be more inclined to think about these kind of things because of the coronavirus pandemic and how it has exposed some of the inherent weaknesses in our system, both in terms of education and in terms of uh, older person care. Absolutely. Um, the, the pandemic has, as you say, exposed the lack of resilience in the system. And um, it's made people very conscious of how that lack of resilience broadly at a, in terms of the economy and our society as a whole can actually then end up really having a direct impact on your family. Hmm. A lot of that is about public services. So making sure that we have efficient, effective, well-run public services. Money is a part of that, but I think there's also a really big reform agenda. Um, so the second kind of story we tell about the future of the country is what we call invest to save. And it's about saying investing early uh, in early intervention actually saves the taxpayer so much more in the long term. What a, a great example of that, of course, is SureStart, 
whereby supporting uh, young people and working families, it makes sure that both parents can can work because they, they know that they can put their, their child into a, uh, a really uh, welcoming and, and well-run um, establishment. Um, uh, but it is also about ensuring that that when that child is ready for school, mm -hmm. they are school ready. Uh, yeah. They are, you know, they've 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 got that ability to interact and communicate, and and we've got the skills uh, that they need to to make the best of coming into primary school. And that, in the long term, saves the taxpayer money because you end up with uh, kids getting a much better education, getting better qualifications, uh, not. Um, ending up in in crime and other things that are a massive drain on mm. uh, on public finances. So invest to save is a big part of this, and it's about building that long term resilience. And the other side of the resilience piece is is around saying we need to make our economy far less exposed and and up for sale around mm. the world. You know, vast swathes of our uh, na national infrastructure and assets are owned by foreign companies. We're mm. flogging off our defense companies to the Americans. You know, a third of Hinkley Point nuclear power station is owned by the Chinese government uh, with a, this hostile foreign takeover capital of the world. So we also need to build resilience in terms of the economy. So we, the third big story we tell in the Renaissance is, is about a Britain that can stand more firmly on its own two feet. So both the invest to save and the Britain standing more firmly on its own two feet and jobs you can raise a family on, they are actually all about building resilience. And it's resilience for your family and for your community and for your country. Mm -hmm. uh, and those need to hang together. That's the story we're really trying to tell about building a more resilient Britain. Mm -hmm. And absolutely. And, and on the point of um, foreign ownership of, of companies, and, and you also see it with um, housing as well, houses being bought up as investments by um, foreign business people who don't live in them and then simply, you know, will sell them off when they can um, get the best possible price for them. Do you think then that there has to be um, some sort of like um, recognition as to the limits of foreign investment that we can have in Britain in terms of companies being taken over and being uh, run by uh, foreign businesses and that we have to find some way of sort of balancing it between companies that are British owned as, as well as still allowing uh, foreign investors to be able to invest in the UK and to help it be as successful as possible? Yes, I, I think we need a clearly defined public interest uh, uh, clause mm. in the uh, National Security and Investment Act, for example. I mean, mm. the, the, the Conservatives have put that through Parliament. It's gone into legislation now, but I think it needs to be repealed. We tried mm. to get that in. And, and what that would say is, you know, when you've got um, an asset, uh, let's take, for example, AstraZeneca, mm -hmm. right? I mean, an amazing British asset, with huge amounts of incredibly valuable intellectual property, and it's, and it's rooted in the UK, it's, it's partnered with a Swedish mm -hmm. company, of course, but it's rooted in the UK, and it's it's one of the jewels in our crown, mm -hmm. right? Uh, you know, some years ago, you might remember, Will, that, that Pfizer, uh, mm -hmm. another company that's obviously been very made very well, a household name because mm -hmm. of the pandemic, but they, that is a quite a acquisitive, uh, aggressive um, American pharma company. They, they made a bid for AstraZeneca, and there was no real system in place mm. for the government to assess whether or not it was in our national interest to allow AstraZeneca to be sold. And in fact, at the time when Ed Miliband was leader of the Labour Party at the time, it was only because of the political stink that Ed kicked up that it became too politically toxic for Pfizer and they walked away and the hostile foreign takeover fell. Well, I mean, that's no, that's no way to run an economy in terms mm. of protecting your strategic mm. national assets. Similarly, for all of our critical national infrastructure, our, our water companies are owned by the Chinese and, and various uh, private equity firms, mm -hmm. uh, nuclear power, as I mentioned earlier. So we need to start thinking about this much more strategically and saying, of course, we're not opposed to foreign direct investment. We need to be open to those opportunities. But we also need, need to know as well where we draw the line. And that's a, that is a political decision. It's about political leadership and saying, you know what, um, it would not be in our national interest for this company to be sold off um, to a private equity company or an, or an, an investment vehicle or to the uh, vehicle that's backed by the Chinese government. Mm. Um, it's simply not in our national interest and we're not gonna be able to rebuild those jobs and have that long-term investment culture 
um, when your companies are owned by uh, international foreign interests that have no interest or stake in the long-term health and viability and resilience of the local community. Mm. Uh, so that's, those, those criteria have to be brought in and the, our economic model needs to be completely changed. And that's one of the big stories that we tell in the Renaissance. Mm. And do you think it also has to be made clear the distinction between um, companies which are owned by uh, states, like, for example, you, you, you mentioned there with nuclear power, how it is effectively directly owned by the Chinese state rather than a, a, a separate Chinese company? Do you think that there has to be a clear distinction made between uh, companies that have no involvement or no connection with the state and then perhaps being, you know, more open to, to, to doing business in Britain than companies that are effectively just an arm of uh, another nation's state. Yeah, I think the, when you have a public interest clause, it needs to be based on a number of criteria. Part of the criteria are what is the company that's up for sale? Mm -hmm. And then what is the identity of the buyer? Mm -hmm. And you've got to look at those two factors. Uh, now, you know, if, if a, a company that's rooted in Britain um, is is says that they're interested in selling to a British owned and run consortium, mm -hmm. that's a factor in the and you'll in yep. the assessment. You, but you need clear criteria to assess whether or not it's actually in the long term national interest uh, to allow that uh, sale to go ahead. But if if there is a foreign buyer and that foreign buyer uh, has a track record of asset stripping, mm -hmm. uh, of coming in and sweating the asset and flogging it off, and just um, leading to thousands of redundancies and lot the shareholders and the directors of the company lining their pockets and making a fast buck out of it off the back of workers. Uh, we have to stop that. Um, it's just, you know, with there's very few uh, countries in certainly in the European Union, and actually the United States have got some pretty uh, tough legislation on uh, allowing um, these uh, takeovers to go ahead. And we need to stop our economy just being a kind of um, cash cow mm -hmm. for lawyers and accountants and consultants and mergers, mergers and acquisition people, the army of people that you have in the city of London doing all this stuff, uh, to the detriment of the workforces out in the communities where these companies are based. Uh, that, that balance needs to shift, uh, and, and that is a matter of some considerable urgency. Mm -hmm. um, I'd like now, uh, if I can, to shift to your work as a uh, shadow minister for Asia and the Pacific. Today, we have um, had news that an American journalist uh, who was imprisoned by uh, the government of uh, Myanmar, that he has been uh, released and he's going to be able to um, go home. Uh, Myanmar is obviously a nation that has had uh, a great uh, series of troubles recently, not least uh, related to um, both the military, but also related um, to coronavirus. There have been um, potential worries that because the borders of Myanmar are somewhat fluid at the moment, that if people are suffering um, from COVID, then they might uh, travel to other nations and you know not be able to, to stop the spread of the virus. How much of um, an issue do you think the situation in Myanmar is? And do you think that there should be... Uh, much more, you know, um, press coverage of it and perhaps a bit more political capital uh, related to helping the country uh, solve the situation that is currently in. Yeah, I'm hugely concerned about uh, Myanmar. There is a massive military build-up happening now in Chin State in the northwest of the country. And I think we could be looking at a repeat of the uh, awful um, uh, atrocities that were perpetrated against the Rohingya people mm -hmm. uh, back in, in 2017. Um, the the, 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 uh, the the Myanmar army, the military and the top brass, of course, run the country. Mm -hmm. uh, they are fascists mm -hmm. and they are utterly ruthless and they have uh, taken power back from uh, Aung San Suu Kyi by force in a military coup uh, they're utterly uh, unreconstructed dictators. Mm. And they, I, I think they are um, gearing up to um, conduct uh, terrible atrocities in Chin State. We've been calling for more sanctions on mm. the uh, Myanmar military and on all of the companies that bankroll them. 
Um, and uh, to be fair to the government, we have seen a number of those sanctions coming forward. But I feel that there's a lack of urgency around what's happening now in Chin State. We've pushed the government to call a special meeting of the UN Security Council, which they did. But the resolution that came out of that was very weak uh, because, of course, everything's been watered down by Russia and China. Mm -hmm. Um, so we've got this is yet another example of the dysfunctional nature of the multilateral system. And um, it's a real problem in places like Myanmar where we can't get um, a global arms embargo, for example. Mm. So the number of countries that have an arms embargo is growing, but it needs to be global. And it's mm. frankly utterly disgraceful that Beijing and Moscow are, are standing in the way of this. So... We've got to keep pushing away. We've, we've got to try and keep bringing the world's attention to this issue. But it is difficult, frankly. Mm, it yes, isn't as high up in the news as it should be. And I'm terribly worried that by the time we wake up to what's going on out there, it'll be too late. Mm. Do you think that there are also um, wider, broader issues uh, in Asia that need um, much more uh, public attention on them and perhaps political attention as well? I mean, we have obviously seen um, perhaps a... Um, a heightening of um, skirmishes between India and Pakistan and India and China. There have, of course, been um, many uh, disputes and a con continued uh, lack of freedom for the Kashmiri people related to whether they wish to be a part of, of, of Pakistan or India or whether they wish to be an independent uh, nation state they have been effectively uh, cut off for uh, quite a while now from the rest of the world. And of course, we have um, China uh, continuing to, to to gear up its guns towards Taiwan. Do you think that there really needs to be more focus on what is happening in Asia at the moment? Because there seems to be quite a lot of things that could result in something much more serious occurring, but there hasn't really been much coverage of it or, or, or really much political pressure put on the various nations that are involved. Yes, I, you know, I, I worry uh, that our country could end up becoming quite insular. And I totally understand that people are focused on the day-to-day -day challenges that they face in their in their everyday lives. But um, what's going on out there in the world uh, just often does come back to bite us. You know, if you look at what happened in Afghanistan over mm -hmm. the summer, well, if, if the collapse of the Afghan economy uh, following the, the, the victory of the Taliban uh, ends up with... Afghanistan once again becoming a, a a launch pad for international terror attacks. That that is local. Mm -hmm. That's bringing the global to the local. Mm -hmm. Similarly, you know, if things continue to deteriorate in terms of uh, the way in which China is behaving in the region, that can have repercussions here in the UK. Mm -hmm. And and of course, when you talk about the Kashmir issue, um, the huge Kashmiri mm -hmm. heritage community yes, in this yes. country, and they're Absolutely. deeply affected by um by what's happening out there and, and in each case the labor party has to stand up for the universal values uh that we um that we cherish uh yeah. which are about protecting people's human rights protecting their right to protest protecting their right to speak out not allowing these authoritarian regimes to just uh, to run roughshod uh over uh, people who are simply uh, standing up for what they believe in and asking for fair treatment. We're not interested in interfering in the internal affairs mm. of, of countries and um, and their, their sort of policy decisions that they're making. Uh, that is the business of those countries as sovereign nations, but where international law is being violated, mm -hmm. where international rights and standards are being breached, then we, we must speak out against that and, and we must be prepared to take action. We've got to build alliances with uh, democratic countries in the region, in, in Asia, uh, and we've got to stand firm with our allies um, who share our values, and, and it's also about protecting our national interests. So, mm -hmm. you know, there are some troubling developments in the region. I completely agree with that. Um, as, as you mentioned earlier, as an opposition, it's, it's limited what we can do, which is very, very frustrating. Um, you know, I would love to be sitting here and talking to you as the minister for mm. uh, for Asia and the Pacific, not the shadow minister. But, um, you know, we've got to demonstrate that Labour is a, a government in waiting, not just an opposition standing on the sidelines and throwing rocks at the government, but, but actually uh, a constructive opposition, but also a robust one, which is a credible party of government. 
And the key for us, I think, is to set out and make clear that we're we're passionately internationalist. We passionately believe in in building bridges and building alliances. And that's why we're so troubled with what this government has been doing, which seems to be all about trashing our relationships with with key allies and partners. Um, that's no way to run a foreign policy. Mm. Uh, and we've got to be robust in also yeah. defending our national interest and demonstrate that we are a deeply patriotic party mm -hmm. that that really thinks that Britain's best days are ahead of it, that we've got a proud, so much to be proud of, mm -hmm. um, but that but the, this government is diminishing our ability to, to actually build influence in the world. A classic example of that, of course, is the, the decision to um, abandon the uh, adherence to 0.7% uh, of GDP as our, mm -hmm. for our aid program, mm -hmm. um, which is diminishing our soft power, diminishing our influence, diminishing our convening power. So we're very worried about this government making us isolated and irrelevant in the world. And that's why, you know, we need a Labour government that can actually mm -hmm. start to rebuild some of these alliances and, and rebuild Britain's global reputation. Absolutely. Um, we're coming towards the end of the podcast and I have one final question for you, Stephen. We're coming up uh, to Christmas. People are obviously buying Christmas presents in preparation for the season. So if you had to buy a Christmas present for uh, Keir Starmer, you might have already bought him a Christmas present, and uh, Boris Johnson, what Christmas presents would you buy uh, for the Prime Minister and the Leader of the Opposition? Oh my goodness. Uh... <laughs> <laughs> Oh, well, for Boris Johnson, clearly he needs a lie detector test. <laughs> uh, I'd be more than happy to provide that and, and ask yeah. a few questions, see what, he, see what he does. I reckon he'd fail every single one. <laughs> um, for Keir, uh, well, Keir's a, a, a huge football fan. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah, I reckon, I, reckon I'd, um, I reckon I'd buy him a, a you, you, parliament, for, I, play, I play in the Parliament football team yeah. and I'm trying to get Keir to come along and play for us. So I'm going to get him one of our shirts <laughs> and I'll get, get it for Christmas. So then he's got no excuse for not coming along and having a game with us. Well, I hope that you get that shirt to him and he gets along to have a game with you after Christmas. Thank you once again for coming on the podcast, Stephen. If people want to find out more about you and about Labour Renaissance, where should they go to find out more? Well, we have a website. Uh, so if they just Google uh, Labour Renaissance, uh, the website should come up. And there you'll have a copy of the report that I mentioned earlier and some of the articles and blogs that we've done. And it would be great for people to sign up uh, because we're very keen uh, to build uh, the membership of Renaissance. And, and as I say, reach out. Uh, we're in the process of presenting the report to a number of CLPs, constituency Labour parties across the country. So we'd be delighted to come and do that in in a, your CLP or a CLP near you. Excellent. Fantastic. Thank you once again for coming on the podcast. Thanks for the invitation, Will. I appreciate it. Thank you for listening to this episode of the podcast. If you've enjoyed it, you can subscribe to us on iTunes, Spotify, Podbeam and Amazon Music. You can also follow us on Twitter, at Debated Podcast, like us on Facebook, Debated Podcast, and if you'd like to get in touch with us, whether about appearing on an episode of the podcast or commenting on an episode that you've listened to, you can do so at thedebatedpodcast at gmail.com. Thank you for listening. I hope you listen to the next one.